So the topic of this little lecture piece is two-stage district heat production. So how do we do it, why we do it, how do we calculate the process? So first off, a quick recap of how the district heat condensers work. So we produce the district heat in the condenser. So the idea is that the turbine exhaust steam condenses on the outside of the tubes and that heats the district heating water that is being used as coolant and what flows inside of the tubes. And these condensers work basically, uh, functionally they are just like the vacuum condensers of large uh, condensing power plants, but because we are talking about higher pressure steam, we have less volumetric flow rate and we can get away with a lot smaller, more compact, simpler construction, very similar to low pressure feed heaters. So these are always shell and tube condensers, steam condenses on the tube outside and practically always U-tube construction. And we remember that we always want to draw the temperature diagram. So this is more or less how it looks like. Same idea as with a condensing power plant vacuum condenser. We always get steam in, well, practically always, we should get steam always in, in wet steam state. So no de-superheating, fairly low TTDs. We're talking about maybe two, three, four degrees Celsius typically. And one, addition that is uh, in contrast to the vacuum condensers is that here we actually do have subcooling marked here. Now most of the time we want to still operate without the subcooling but we very much want to have the option of subcooling if we want to. So we remember what, what it does when you subcool condensate in the condenser. It means that you are removing more heat from the power cycle. So in a condensing power plant, it's a bad thing because it means we are dumping more energy into the environment that we have to pay money to get more fuel to replace that energy. But here we're dumping the energy from the steam cycle into the district heating water. So we are producing district heat with all that heat. We are doing it at the expense of power generation, but there can be situations where we want to do that and that's why we want to have the option. So DCA drain cooler approach, similar as with uh, feed heaters. So maybe from five to 10 degrees Celsius, typically a little bit more than terminal temperature difference here. So with this having been said, now let's take a look at two stage district heating production. So here we have a uh, diagram how it is implemented, what it means, and basically this is something that we have almost always implemented in all but the very smallest cogeneration plants producing district heat. So idea here is that uh, if we look at the temperatures here for example, so here is our district heat consumers, the green arrows, they are the district heating water, and now what we do is that we have basically two condensers in series, First, we heat the water halfway and only then we take extraction steam and heat it all the way up. So basically, it allows us to have lower back pressure. Now, if we had normal uh, single stage, well, normal and normal, I mean, that would be abnormal. Actually, normal is two stage, but let's say that uh, similar to a condensing power plant, uh, basic ranking cycle one condenser. If we wanted to produce 90 degrees district heating water, it would mean that uh, basically uh, our expansion would stop here at one bar. That would be, we, we would have no, no option of expanding any further. And now what we do here is we let half of the steam expand further to heat, to preheat the district heating water halfway up and that way our uh, power generation goes up because we remember from the second lecture that it's one of the central principles in Rankine cycle efficiency is that when we reduce condenser pressure or more generally in any kind of thermal cycle when we reduce the average temperature of heat removal that always increases our efficiency. So basically what it does is that it allows us to convert 
fuel, which is typically fairly cheap, into electricity at boiler efficiency, basically. So everything that we get from the boiler into the steam cycle gets converted to either heat or electricity. And we run according to heat load. So with this construction, we get a bit more electricity out of that. Now, we've got an example because we always want to draw a TS diagram because that helps us understand how the efficiency works out. So here is drawn a very simple back pressure CHP plant, live steam values, 500 Celsius, 80 bars, so fairly typical for biomass fired back pressure plants. We see that this is a real power plant cycle because first of all, we have the pressure drop going on here, 80 bars isobar, we start from maybe 90 something and then in the superheater, there's pressure drop, we end up there. And then our expansion line goes a little bit towards the right towards increased entropy. And then we have to condenser and this would be how it works with one bar back pressure. So we can also see that our power generation efficiency is going to be quite noticeably less than if we had a vacuum condenser at the 0.05 bars, for example. So we can get to 0.05 bars, but what we can do if we add two stage district heating production, typical case might be that if we are producing fairly hot water, about one bar back pressure, then we might, with the addition of a second condenser, get the other condenser, the one that operates at lower pressure, preheating the return water of the district heating system. We might get to around half a bar, and that's like this. So not a huge deal perhaps, but still substantial, non-negligible. So we want to do this if there is the option. Now you might want to ask that uh, how come we don't do this usually in condensing power plants? And well, basically the main reason here is that uh, if we're talking about condensing power plants, we remember that typically we would have maybe 10 degrees, 12 degrees at best. Uh, temperature increase in the coolant water because we are pumping a lot of water through. We don't want to heat that water up more than we really need to. So if we add second stage condenser there, yes, we would get some additional, but we also remember that the, the low pressure ends in condensing power plants, they are fairly massive. So they are expensive, they are complex to begin with. and we would only basically split uh, 10 to 12 degrees into two 5 to 6 degree changes. But here in back pressure district heating, we're talking about increasing the temperature of 40 to 50 degrees return water to maybe 70 to 120 degrees. So when you split that in half, you get a much more substantial increase in power generation. This is the reason why we do this in back pressure district heating, but we don't do it in condensing power plants. Now let's take a look at another example on how we do the calculation if we compare a single condenser, simple district heat generation, and we want to convert that into two-stage district heating. So here is our case. So we have here a turbine labeled DHT for district heating turbine. Of course, we are not producing district heat in the turbine. Turbine produces uh, mechanical power to the shaft. We call it district heating turbine because at the end of the turbine is a district heating condenser. This will be the temperature diagram. This will be how we typically run it. So if we have only one stage condenser, we don't usually want to do a subcooling for reasons explained in the very beginning of this presentation. Now, if we want to change this into two-stage production, so now we are starting from 50 degrees and producing 90 degrees water. Terminal temperature difference, three degrees. So let's into half. And now here, first of all, we see a little bit different construction. So it's not just simple instruction, but when we have large district heating turbines, it's very common to have this kind of two-run construction, just like we had with the low pressure condensing power plant turbines. But from the perspective of the expansion curve, nothing changes really. 
So here in the cold and in the cold turbine, we expand all the way to whatever pressure we have here. And here is the hot condenser. And we start expanding along the exact same curve, but we just don't go all the way to it. So in that sense, from thermodynamics perspective, this is exactly the same situation as if we had just single run turbine and an extraction. Now, how does this construction then look like if we draw both of our temperature diagrams? So we are splitting our heating of the district heating water from 50 to 90 to first 50 to 70 and then 70 to 90. So the other one looks like this. And before even we look at the second one, we notice that something changed also here on the hotter condenser. We added subcooling. And this is one of the situations where we typically always want to do the subcooling. And we want to do it for two reasons. Reason number one is energy efficiency. So basically, whatever steam we are taking into this condenser, be it extraction or like it is here from the hotter run of the two run turbine. Whatever we steam we took from there, we want to extract all the energy out of it that we can. And that's why we subcool. If we didn't subcool, what would happen is that we would basically have to take just a little bit more steam here so that when we only condense, the amount of energy transferred is the same because we want to do this half half. Okay, what happens then is we have less steam left going here, less steam expands fully, so we lose some energy. The other reason is purely practical and mechanical, so if we don't subcool here, basically when this condensate is sent to the shell side of the lower pressure condenser, some of the saturated condensate, liquid condensate, would flash into steam. And that is a pretty violent phenomenon. We can handle it, we can put an impingement plate, but we don't want to make our life more difficult than it has to be. And we don't want to consume and destroy that impingement plate and have it replaced sooner than it has to be. So better also from that perspective to subcool it. This way also there is going to be some uh, flashing, but a whole lot less than if we would flash all the way this distance. Now, continuing further how we do the calculation. So we had three de uh, degrees terminal temperature difference in the hot condenser, probably something similar in the colder one. That means that if we heat the water to 70, we're condensing at 73. Okay, if that's the saturation temperature, at that temperature, the corresponding saturated pressure is going to be 0.352 bar. So you can find it from the back side of the, of the HS chart. Okay, and then we just simply calculate the expansion that we continue on this side of the turbine. So basically here we also expand all the way to this point, but we are not at the end, we are only right about here. Now we continue to 0.352 bars, so we find the line in here. That's where it is, isentropic expansion first, then we read the value from the enthalpy vertical axis. We get a 2400 and then isentropic expansion efficiency. And we get the final point and that's about how much extra expansion and additional power we end up getting from our turbine this way. And as said previously, basically what this means is that the CHP efficiency of the plant is going to remain about the same. That's not going to change one way or the other. As long as boiler efficiency remains, we are going to produce more electricity with that. And that happening with the same efficiency means that we are consuming more fuel. But we get to convert fuel into electricity with basically boiler efficiency, which is a very good uh, proposition for us in most situations, and that is why this is as common as it is.